Welcome, everyone, to a very special holiday episode of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. I am your co-host, Licensed Battlefield Guide, Eric Lindblade, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Licensed Battlefield Guide, Jim Hessler. Jim, what's our topic today for this special holiday episode? So, Eric, today's episode is a bonus episode, a surprise gift for our listeners as a thank you for wildly exceeding our expectations in Season 1. Today's special guest is none other than Gary Edelman. Now, Gary has a huge social media following and is likely no stranger to many of our listeners. Gary is the director of history and education at the American Battlefield Trust. I'm actually chief historian now. Oh, there you go. He's got, he's been promoted already. And by the way, Gary and I appear on the Trust Gettysburg mobile app, which you should most definitely check out if you have not done so. But Gary is also the author, co-author, or editor of numerous books and articles concerning the Civil War. He's the vice president of the Center for Civil War Photography, and like Eric and I, Gary is a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg. So our topic tonight, we're going to be discussing Gary's 2003 book, The Myth of Little Round Top, which happens to be my second favorite Edelman book. Many historians and books tell us that the Battle of Gettysburg was won, and perhaps a nation was saved at Little Round Top. But was it? And I want to add, too, last but not least, Gary is also the Civil War community's most noteworthy vegan. So we have stocked the chip bowls here at the mine tonight with sushi and tofu in his honor. So, folks, break out your cauliflower, your squash, and your asparagus snacks and enjoy this special episode of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast with none other than Gary Edelman. Now, Eric and Gary, before we get started, this episode is brought to you once again by our friends at RPM Search Group. As many of us know, Little Round Top was saved by union officers and executive level talent working together toward a common goal. At Gettysburg, Chief Engineer Governor K. Warren perched himself upon a rock and used his staff officers as couriers to bring reinforcements to Little Round Top. But... Imagine instead if Warren had just been able to place a call to RPM Search Group and allow founder and managing partner Michael Hamula to find that talent for him. Now, I kid, of course, but for those of us like myself who have to work in today's corporate world, if your company is on a quest for senior and executive level talent, today's strong Vincents and Joshua Chamberlains, then look no further than RPM Search Group. Visit their website at www.rpmsearchgroup.com and see how they help companies in the United States and around the world identify, evaluate, and hire talent that will drive profit, improve your performance, and protect your flank. Now, Eric, before we bring in Gary, where can our listeners find us on social media? As always, you can find us on Facebook at the Battle of Gettysburg Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Gettysburg Pod and on Instagram at the Battle of Gettysburg Podcast. You can also reach us via email at Gettysburg Podcast at gmail.com. So please like us, share us, become part of the conversation. Okay, so as we said at the intro, joining us today in the world-famous Reliance Mind Saloon, the Battle of Gettysburg podcast recording studios, is none other than historian Gary Edelman. Welcome, Gary. Well, thanks so much for having me, guys. I, I, this is a subject I love, and uh, even if this were an eight-parter, I don't think we could cover it all. But like Jim said, this whole thing, you know, the United States would be a different place today were it not for what some men from Maine and Pennsylvania, New York and Michigan, if you're kind enough to even acknowledge the presence of the New Yorkers, Michiganders and the uh, Pennsylvania troops, you know, were it not for them, we'd live in a different place today that the whole experiment in American democracy, you know, might fail were it not for some of those folks doing certain things, a textbook maneuver, it was once called on Little Round Top. And I, I fell into that, you know, and in fact, my first experience sort of with this was As I became a licensed battlefield guide and got to know Charlie Fennell, also one of the licensed battlefield guides who's obsessed with Culp's Hill, and properly would point out that Culp's Hill is much more important than Little Round Top. And at first, I was probably, you know, a little bit reluctant, but I questioned it ever since I became a guide. 
started wondering how important Little Round Top was. And as I talked to more people about it and started looking into it and started tracking what people were saying about the hill, and more importantly, what they said they would do with the hill if the Confederates captured it, I just became convinced this was just a massive misinformation or myth as it was. And that's what sort of led to me exploring this first in a 600 level master's degree course, and then ultimately in my master's thesis, which became the book that Jim mentioned. So Gary, actually, my first question was going to be, tell the listeners how and when you came around to rethinking of Little Round Top as a myth. So thanks for kind of blowing our first question already. Good job, man. Yeah. So as far as the when, my first trip to Gettysburg was, of course, before the Gettysburg movie and before Ken Burns came out. I first came out at the 125th, right after the reenactment had ended. I was obsessed with Little Round Top. I'm a photo guy and historic photos are taken like crazy at Devil's Den, Little Round Top in the Valley of Death. So I just love the place. I even put a bunch of water bottles full in my backpack and ran up Little Round Top, not knowing the attack was actually on the south side of the hill. I ran up the west side of the hill because that's what I would have figured at the time. You know, so I was obsessed with it and I spent all this time up there. So it wasn't with relish that later, you know, starting with meeting Charlie Fennell in 1990 and then becoming a guide in 1995, in between that time when I started to question it, it was not with relish. I mean, Little Round Top and Devil's Den are my favorite places on the planet, but history is history and there's no reason to propagate myth. Uh, we should be able to separate fact from fiction. And I hope we'll do a little bit of this. And I hope, by the way, you guys will argue with me if you disagree with anything that I'm saying in the book or otherwise. I've been looking for someone to really qualified argue with me for more more than 15 years about this, and I guess happily without success. One of the things I like about Gary's book, there's a lot of things I like about the book, but one of the things I like is kind of the way you you laid it out, battle and defense, then you talk about how that sort of becomes the legend, and then kind of ends with military analysis. We didn't think we would really get too into the weeds on discussing the battle and defense, but you know, as a battlefield guide who's kind of used to doing things concisely and summarily, you want to kind of set the stage for the listeners, just talk a little bit about you know where things start on Little Round Top at the Battle of Gettysburg, and we'll go from there. Yes, thanks, Jim. I love talking about this. Let's see if we can do it in less than a minute and a half. So July 2nd, 1863, south end of the Gettysburg battlefield, the Southerners launch a massive attack, the largest attack at Gettysburg of Hood's division, McLaw's division, and parts of Anderson's division. Call it 15,500 soldiers or so that are going to attack these places that you all know, Little Round Top, Devil's Den, the Wheatfield Peach Orchard, and Cemetery Ridge Trossel Farm. But they're going to get commingled in their attempt to go sort of up the Emmitsburg Road versus toward where the Union left flank is actually resting at that time. The brigades, uh, Georgians, Texans, Arkansans, Alabamians under John Bell Hood get commingled. And ultimately, two different brigades are going to end up really attacking Little Round Top. That is about half of Law's Brigade of Alabamians and half of Robertson's Brigade of Texans and Arkansans. So I think you know some of this already. Of course, the Union soldiers, there's no one on Little Round Top until the attack is already underway. And of course, the first brigade to arrive under the first in his class at Harvard, one of the best looking men in the Union Army, Strong Vincent, and that kind of guy that could come onto the battlefield and really command people, even if he were in civilian clothes. Of course, you're going to have almost equal numbers come. Those five Confederate regiments that are truly attacking Little Round Top will end up coming into contact with four of Vincent's regiments and one, the 140th New York under Patrick O'Rourke. That's part of Weed's brigade, and they fight, and they fight like crazy in a line sort of going from west to southeast around the brow of the hill. The first attacks go with the 4th Texas and then the 5th Texas really attacking up toward the castle on Little Round Top, the 16th Michigan and the uh, 80, and the uh, 44th New York. Of course, co the Confederates are repulsed each time. They almost get around the Union flank at that point when Michiganders retire. And then, of course, you have the 140th New York show up, some of them probably without even guns loaded, pitching into the Texans. And those attacks start to slow down right as they are moving up on the other side of the line when the 4th, 47th, and 15th Alabama are fighting against the 83rd Pennsylvania and the 20th Maine. And that is a particularly vicious fight uh, that goes back and forth like a great wave until a third of the men from Alabama are down, a third of the men from Maine and Pennsylvania are down. Both sides are looking for ammunition from their dead and wounded comrades. And uh, of course, you see the uh, Alabamians forming for one final charge after, I don't know, three, four, five different charges, depending on who you listen to. And of course, famously now, and it did happen that the main men put bayonets on the end of their guns and 
charge down. Uh, how do they swing? They swing in some particular way, right? Does anybody know? Like a door. Ah, oh, that's right, like a door. And, and no doubt they got together in battle and discussed this while everything was quiet. And then they said they were going to do that. And then they pitched into the Alabamans who ran like, quote, according to Oates, a herd of wild cattle. Of course, some additional Union forces, sharpshooters, and some, some men of Company B, 20th Maine, are firing into the side, flank, and rear of the Alabamians. And the Yankees charged up Big Round Top in their wake and were supposedly going to chase them all the way on to Richmond. That was definitely more than a minute and a half. Great summary as far as the battle action for July 2nd. So it kind of sets the stage. We got a lot of Union troops, as many people know, obviously rushing to the hill and to more or less protect the Union left flank against this massive attack that you talked about coming from General Longstreet's First Corps. I've got a question or two that I just kind of wanted to get into related to that. If we back up a little bit, even to the evening of July 1st, and I think this will kind of play into, you know, your premise about the, the myth and all of that. You know, I often hear some pretty esteemed people People, and I'm not going to mention any names, I'm not talking about anybody in the studio right now, say to the effect that no one ordered that hill occupied until the late afternoon of July 2nd. And, you know, if you believe that, that plays into the myth of Little Round Top. But quite frankly, I don't think that's accurate from a federal perspective. You know, I think the Union High Command did appreciate the significance of the hill, at least as early as the evening of July 1st. And kind of want to throw that out to you guys. Is everybody agree? Agree with this? Do they disagree with it? What do you guys think? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think it's a natural barrier to anchor a flank of a line on, just like Culp's Hill is going to be to the right. Little Round Top makes the most military sense on the left. So whether or not they see it as militarily important to hold, they do have troops in the vicinity. They're going to have them anchored on that end of the line. I completely agree with you guys. You know, we know that you have a couple of Geary's regiments there on the night of July 1st, so that's not for nothing. I, I wonder about their placement of their monument for those who have seen it way north on the hill, like near the Wheatfield Road. And I wonder if they weren't a little bit further up. But either way, even from there then, the trees were not where they are now. They'd have been able to see into the Valley of Death, see all the way out to the Emmitsburg Road and what we now call Seminary Ridge, of course. So, you know, I clearly think that the Union Command is already thinking about it. I also think it's sort of a non-issue. The fact is, it sat at the end of what we now call the fish hook. The Union occupied it, the Union fought for it, and everybody increasingly later said it was important. And I think, too, it's interesting looking at George Meade's mindset on the evening of July 1st into the early morning hours of July 2nd. I don't really think he's thinking of an attack on the left end of his line. No, I think he's he mostly focused in the vicinity of Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill. I mean, Meade's going to make those comments to Governor Warren as well as Henry Slocum. Hey, can we make an attack out from this yeah. direction? So I think they're there to cover the end of the line, but not necessarily there to, hey, this could be an important position later in the day. And still sticking with July 1st, on my battlefield tours, I often give Hancock credit for this. And it's about one of the few ways you can work Hancock into the Sickles tour. But, you know, Hancock specifically when he's coming into Gettysburg, eventually on the evening of July 1st, talks about Gettysburg being a good position, but one that is easily turned. And as part of that, Hancock is talking about the, quote, the immediate need of a division on our left was imperative. So, I mean, to the points here, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody's specifically saying, ah, the round tops, but a general idea that, look, we're susceptible to flanking from the left and we got to get somebody there. Let me just quote Geary and then I'll turn the microphone back over. Geary talks about in his report that he extended portions of his 1st and 3rd Brigades to a range of hills south and west of the town which I occupied with two regiments of the 1st Brigade. These hills I regarded as of the utmost importance since their possession by the enemy would give him an opportunity of enfilading our entire left wing and center with a fire which could not fail to dislodge us from our position. Now again, maybe we'll We'll argue today whether Geary is right or wrong in that, but that was at least how, how Geary reported it. So I just wanted to call that out because I hear this on social media a lot. Nobody cared about Little Round Top till the late afternoon of July 2nd, and that is, in my opinion, wrong. Yeah, I'm actually glad you brought up, Geary, because if we can start to get into what people said about it, what, what I wanted to do was not look at what the Gettysburg movie or what Ken Burns said about Little Round Top, but let's look at the earliest accounts there were. And for the most part, beside a few newspaper articles, these are the official records. I think you all know that, uh, you know, surviving officers who had the time are going to submit official reports. These usually aren't flashy documents. They're meant to describe what their unit did, who's on your left, who, do you, who was on your right, what were you ordered to do, what did you do, and then what did you do? There are 30 
37 accounts in the official records. Yes, I've read them all. You know, if you ever have some time to go through all of the three parts of volume, I think 27 of the official records that cover Gettysburg, man, is it a worthwhile exercise. So I found 37 early accounts in the official records, 20 Union, 17 Confederate. And they mentioned something about the high Rocky Hill. It's not called Round Top. It's not called Little Round Top. Some, some are later going to call it Stony Point, Weeds Hill, and other things like that. Some will call it Devil's Den. But of those 37, only nine refer to it as being important. Romaine Ayers, who's a division commander, called it a hill of great importance. Colonel Rogers of the 5th Texas. It was an impregnable position. Only five of those nine, in other words, five of 37, go further than mentioning it. And four call it the key to the left. And Geary's account sort of stands out as, here's what you could do with it. Okay, you could, you could not fail to unhinge our entire position. So right there, you start to have, you know, and his isn't written until the end of July, as far as I recall. You know, you start to have people getting this idea that, okay, what happened here was important. Let's call it that. But it would go much further than that before long. That's interesting. In rereading your book, a lot of the initial accounts from the ORs, a lot of it's conditional. What might they be able to do? What maybe they could do? It doesn't say they will do this if they haven't, but the potential is there. And I think that's something that kind of gets lost, I think, sometimes. We just say, hey, if they get the hill, it's all over. Well, maybe Maybe not. And we'll discuss that a little later. Yeah. You know, my only problem sometimes with all of this is, and even it came up in our introduction, well, so-and-so said Culp's Hill is way more important. Well, have, have we done any sort of similar analysis on Culp's Hill and said, well, okay, X number of guys mentioned Culp's Hill of extreme importance in their reports, you know, and things of that nature. And I don't know, maybe we have, maybe we haven't. So I, my jimmies get rustled a little bit when we sort of kind of bringing this into context with Culp's Hill is, is way more important. But I think, yeah, in general, we're on the same page in terms of guys not necessarily saying, hey, the round tops, you know, the most important position until later on. And that's, one, again, one of the things I really like about your book. I like how you laid all this out. Good, thanks. And I think it's a great point. I would love it if somebody did this for Culp's Hill. I'm not aware that not only has nobody tracked the growth of any interest in Culp's Hill, by the way, Culp's Hill, more popular than Little Round Top in the early months and years after the battle, close to town, photographed with the you know remnants of battle, the bullet-scarred trees still there. So Culp's Hill had its day in the sun, uh, had a few years in the sun, as a matter of fact. But I also, on tours, talk about how if the Confederates capture Upper Culp's Hill, the Union has to either get it back or leave. It's that simple. And I see that as more important than Little Round Top. But I'll tell you what, I've never analyzed it, how many Confederates are there, how many would they have needed to control the Baltimore Pike? We'll talk about that a little bit for a little round top when we get into the Tawny Town Road. So we've kind of started talking about the perceived or lack of perceived military significance from the Union side. How about on the Confederate side? You know, as, as I think many people know, when we're analyzing the second day's attack, Confederate General Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, in their reports, do not specifically call out Little Round Top as an objective. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, of the accounts, you have Union and Confederate soldiers both sort of giving Little Round Top a sort of tepid welcome that it was there. It was a high rocky hill. Like I said, some of the Confederates called it impregnable. Henry L. Benning was among them. Uh, Colonel Rogers of Texas was also among them doing that. But it was only later that they started to talk about the foregone conclusions of what the Confederates could have done with Little Round Top in their possession. So note that as we go on, that this is an important leap from Confederate capture to Confederate control and then to having the troops there to do all the things they said they would do with it in their possession. Yeah. And, you know, obviously some of this is ground we covered in our uh, two-part Peach Orchard episode. But, you know, even prepping for this particular episode, I went back and I read Lee's battle reports again, you know, and even what you might consider his July 4th report, his July 31st report, and then the, the more detailed January 1864 report. In this context, more than anything, what stands out to me, particularly when you read Lee's July 4th and July 31st reports, is basically the objective is gain the federal position. You know, and there's other things and caveats that go along with that, but it's gaining the federal position. And again, as many of us know, there's nothing in either of those reports that basically says capture the round tops because it's it's going to be the key to the position. I think, though, when you get to the January 1864 report, which, again, is a little more detailed, where Lee talks about it was determined to make the principal attack upon the enemy's left, yada, yada, yada. Longstreet was directed to place the division of McClaws and Hood on the right of Hill, envelop the enemy's left, which he was to drive in. To me, you know, what I always sort of look at that as is, okay, it's making the attack on the Union left, in my opinion, 
Union more historically significant than the attack against the Union right. Because when we talk about Ewell and Culp's Hill, Ewell was instructed to make a simultaneous demonstration to be converted into a real attack if the opportunity will offer. Yeah, I mean, you know, it has to, you know, fit into one of the largest attacks of the Civil War. That is, if you consider the movement of the two and a half divisions of the Confederate Army on July 2nd to be a coordinated movement. If so, you're talking about 15,500. You know, that's going to put it ahead of Pickett's charge. It's the biggest charge at Gettysburg. And you're right, it's on the Union left, not on the Union right. Even as Charlie Fennell might like to point out, when you look at a fish hook, what's at Little Round Top, the sort of eye of the hook? That's not going to hurt you if you touch that. You know, you go over to Culp's Hill, there's the barb, and that's what's going to snag you away. And it is close to Cemetery Hill, and it is close to Baltimore Pike. But I would never say Little Round Top is unimportant. I would only say that what people said about it changed over time. And let me yeah. get into that right now. And that uh, how they said those things would happen is irresponsible when you really look at it. As far as why things change over time, you know, three of us could sit down 20 years from now and talk about this or any of the other subjects you all have already covered on this excellent podcast. And we would no doubt come up with different things. Things change. And in the case of the Civil War, you know, uh, you write an official report and then all of a sudden you see that your part of the line isn't getting the respect you need. Right. Uh, the official records aren't meant to be flashy. And now you might have the opportunity to write in a flashier manner. You might have a reputation to protect at that point. And there are numerous other reasons why impressions change, not the least of which is that you forget. Remember, you will probably be listening to this podcast longer than many of the soldiers were ever on Little Round Top during the battle. Wrap your brain around that. And nobody, hopefully at least, is shooting a, at us here in the Reliance mind. And I think you make an interesting point about how memory changes over time. And I think for the officers that are involved, those that survive Little Round Top and those that survive the war, that's something to keep in mind too. And I think the men that fight there, in your later years, I think there is a natural desire of veterans to wrap their mind around what they experienced, give it importance, meaning not only in their own lives and the trauma they suffered, but also the loss of friends in mm -hmm. cases of war family. Sure. And to give this meaning that, yes, they died, but they died to save our nation. That's a powerful feeling. And to connect that to that hill and also for visitors, just go up the little round top. Tell me it's not hard to visualize Confederate troops moving up the hill, Union troops, you know, putting together a stubborn defense. You can visualize it. It's also just scenically absolutely stunning. I always tell people it's the second best view on any Civil War battlefield. I used to say first, and then I went to Lookout Mountain, and that changed yeah, everything. So skewed it a little bit. Yeah. I would agree with that. It's a challenge I have on battlefield tours, even out at East Cavalry Field. You know, it's the same thing. The veterans out there saying, we saved the Union, and we kind of know they probably didn't. But again, it's this idea of, I'm a veteran, I'm coming back, I want to give meaning to what I did. So yeah, I think that's a uh, an interesting sort of memory aspect that you, that you see all over the battlefield. I have an example on Little Round Top to that, you know, I like reading accounts from the men in Hazlitt's Battery or Hazlitt's Battery on Little Round Top, Battery D, 5th US. And we have a good number of accounts, not as many as we'd like, but we have some. And I'm always amazed at how a lot of the people that wrote those accounts didn't write, oh my word, they attacked us and it was it was really intense. Or wow, the next day we watched the largest and grandest attack we'd ever seen in Pickett's Charge. What they wrote is it was really hard to get those cannons up on Little Round Top on July 2nd because they had to haul them up there by hand. So I I think that one soldier's experience, you know, it's very personal to them where they fought. And that's why you have accounts and records of people constantly saying that we never left. We were there last. The troops on my left and right fell back and then we fell back and the troops on their left and right wrote the same thing. So it's an intensely personal event, I suppose, yeah. to be uh, engaged in, in some sort of combat like this. And I just want to include in the same sentence and move on a little bit because all I talked about so far were the official records. But there are newspapers going on at the same time from 1863 to 65. There are a lot of newspaper accounts about the Battle of Gettysburg, most of them from 1863 because, you know, they had a war to cover. So it's not like in 1864, they were constantly going back and writing about Gettysburg. So I picked 10 representative papers. There are more than 10, but a lot of them come from the same pool of reporters. So I picked 10 uh, somewhat indiscriminately and came up with six that mentioned Little Round Top and three of those six. In other words, three out of the 10 cite the importance of Little Round Top. An example, Round Top, whose strength gained the day for our forces. Another said that Round Top was a Gibraltar made by the Almighty mighty when he made the planet. Perhaps all the cannon on earth could not batter it down. So, and, and so on and so on. They talk about soldiers and visitors.
visitors. But then there's this early post-war period. The war is over. People start to reflect on the war's greatest battle again. And, you know, from 1865 to 1873, you have a change. The reflecting and suddenly of the eight accounts that I unearthed during that time that mentioned Little Round Top, all eight say it's important and all eight go farther than that. Seven of the eight maintain that Little Round Top is the key to the left. So that's starting to emerge. Chamberlain himself says it's vast importance to our forces and really was the key to our left. I would also add that the strong artillery position for early visitors starts coming in. They, the visitors see it and say, oh my God, they could drive away the whole Union army. Four of these eight early post-war accounts call it the key to the whole position. Four of the eight talk about a Union retreat if the Confederates capture it. So just within a few years of the battle, people are already bringing in these ideas. It's not only key to the left, but it's key to the whole position and it could drive the Union army away. So, Gary, maybe just clarify then during that period, what do you think is going on? Like, why are people starting to elevate the importance? Is it the veterans? Is it people visiting the battlefield and enjoying the vista? What, what do you think was going on to cause that? I do think there's a lot going on. And around this time, 65 to 73, during the war, you've got George Sykes and George Gordon Meade sort of changing their accounts from their official records to making them a little bit later. And Sykes said his men allowed for the day to be saved. And where did his men fight? Well, largely in that particular vicinity. And Meade called it the key to my whole position. This is the commander of the Union Army. Shouldn't we trust him? He didn't say that in his official report. But you got to really look at their motives. At that time, there was a scandal in a Philadelphia newspaper. Paper. George Sykes is disputing a story by a guy named George Gross, and therefore, by saying that the position we held, the Fifth Corps held, is the most important, it will justify the actions of the men of the Fifth Corps. And Meade has a whole different fight going on with this great entity called the Committee of the, on the Conduct of the War. Who's involved with that there, Jim? That would be today's edition of the Dan Sickles Report, Gary. Or as we often say on other tours when Jim is not around, Sickles. Isn't it the perfect defense for Meade to be able to say that who abandoned the position that I had to send 5, 10, 20, 25,000 soldiers over to preserve, but Dan Sickles. You know what? Little Round Top was the most important. Sickles abandoned it. It's the key to my whole position. And me and the 5th Corps, with the help from the, the 6th and the 12th Corps, are going to help save that. This is a great segue because I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of this does naturally become an offshoot of the so-called Meade-Sickles controversy because as you know they and their partisans are battling over what Sickles did do and what he didn't do on the left flank in their own accounts and in their speeches and their memoirs and their testimony Little Round Top became perceived as more important and you know correct me if you think I'm wrong on that but since you brought up Meade for the listeners sake let's just sort of compare and contrast what Meade said so in Meade's OR October of 63 he basically talks about the action going on, quote, having found Major General Sickles, I was explaining to him that he was too far in advance. Now, to me, you know, I could be reading too much into one phrase, but what I think Meade is emphasizing in that report is that the key sin is you are too far in advance. He doesn't say you abandon the high ground. He doesn't say you abandon the fish hook, but you know that you're too far in advance. And I I think in Meade's report, that's what he's considering to be Sickles' key sin. And then let me go on with that. Quote, and soon after the assault commenced, the Fifth Corps most fortunately arrived, took position on left of the Third. Sykes immediately sent a force to occupy the Round Top Ridge, where a most furious contest was maintained, the enemy making desperate but unsuccessful efforts to secure it. So you're, you're absolutely right. In Meade's report, he doesn't talk about that being a key. But that changes, doesn't it, when he gets before the the Committee on the Conduct of the War. And I know you and I have talked about this before. Yeah, and the main part of it, and I love the way you laid that out. I mean, Meade might not say that Sickles abandoned Little Round Top, but, uh, you know, if you're too far forward, where is back then? I mean, it's a long cemetery ridge, and theoretically on Little Round Top, and any military trained eye would see it was important. I even think Dan Sickles would have seen Little Round Top as important, exactly. but 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 did he, you know, but but what about the ground north of it? What about the ground in front of it? And of course, uh, that's a whole, uh, a whole different podcast, as we know. But Meade, again, then he elevates it, and it's not long after, into the key to his whole position. He doesn't say that in his official records. And I want to say that during this period and the next period, it's not to say that any sort of elevation of Little Round Top's important is unwarranted. I mean, you know, time allows, you know, monuments get erected and then they start gathering at those monuments. There are regimental histories being written. People have to sort out what happened and what didn't. And then you have the veterans publications coming out, the National Tribune, the Confederate Veteran Magazine, and they need to start to sort out what's what. And they've seen who got credit and who's left out. And I just love it because it's Little Round Top. My favorite Joshua Chamberlain quote, 
quote has actually very little to do with any of the popular histories. And I'm only paraphrasing because it's been a long time since I've seen it. But he's talking to another Maine officer. I think he might be in the 19th Maine. The 19th Maine is saying, well, you know, I think that we performed very valiantly at Gettysburg and Chamberlain. So, well, I think we performed very valiantly at Gettysburg. And the 19th guy sort of implied that the 20th was trying to claim too much credit. And Chamberlain very diplomatically said, but isn't it all the slats in the fence that keep the pigs out of the garden? <laughs> saying that we all had done our part. So that's not the Chamberlain we might hear from in the 1890s and early 1900s when he, he was changing his story a little bit and elevating that import. But it's really interesting to watch the veterans kind of work this thing out. And if I may, during this sort of post-war period, you know, 1880 to 1910, the veterans are very active, like I mentioned. Of the 20 accounts that I used, 19 of them mention importance. Seven talk about this thing about the Union will definitely be defeated. If the Confederates capture Little Round Top, uh, William C. Oates, his middle name, leave that. I love middle name trivia. And if you know it, listening at home, go ahead and say it out loud. I love middle name trivia. And he said, if I had one more regiment, we could have completely turned the flank and won Little Round Top. The 20th Maine saved the Union from defeat. Why would they say something like this? Well, if you're going to get your butt kicked, would you rather get your butt kicked by a weak regiment or by a really good strong one on a tough position? So why would he not say that? Later, Porter Farley with the 140th New York says, in a word, get Gettysburg might have been the greatest disaster of the war, a disastrous defeat which would have been almost inevitable. They're going to lose Gettysburg. Oh, my God. Others say the fight saved the nation from disgrace and our army an ignominious rout. Oh, ignominious. That's a good Chancellorsville word for those of you who don't know it. It would have meant the loss of our whole position and victory for the enemy instead of the defeat, which was the beginning of the end. Let's be careful about this here. So now they're not only starting to mention Little Round Top's key to the left, key to the whole position, but now certain Union defeat. And what's going to follow that? It's going to come around before long. Another couple of quotes. Gettysburg would have been known as the place where the Union made its grave. So they're talking about something a little bit more than just the loss of the Battle of Gettysburg. So, Gary, you've touched on veterans accounts, newspaper accounts, and that sort of thing. What about books? You know, when I think of books and I think the influence and perhaps the myth of Little Round Top, you know, one that I always think of is Oliver Wilcox Norton's attack in defense of Little Round Top, which in my view is highly influential. But what, what do you think about books? A lot of what I got comes from regimental histories and they're not books, but Southern Historical Society papers and whatnot. I think it's just great. And I love Attack and Defense of Little Round Top. You know, it is essential. Even if your favorite Pickett's Charge book is, of course, Hessler and Mott's Pickett's Charge book, which it's mine, you should still read Stewart's micro history of Pickett's Charge. And even if you have a favorite Little Round Top treatment, whether that be in Fonz's book or my little tour guide, or eventually another Little Round Top book that comes out, you should still read the Attack and Defense of Little Round Top. It is a masterpiece and it's historiography as well. But I want to say during this whole time, veterans and others are active in writing between 1911 and 1970. They're writing all sorts of secondary sources. Of the 17 I found, all mention Little Round Top as important. Half mention Union retreat. Six mention Union defeat if the Confederates captured Little Round Top. Two, two, talked about a nation split in two if the Confederates captured Little Round Top. Bruce Catton, for the Army of the Potomac to lose Little Round Top was to lose the battle and perhaps the war with it. But you have people like Edwin Coddington and Glenn Tucker still the best campaign and single book Gettysburg treatments that I know of, they're much more measured. They're not saying things like that. But then, of course, along comes Michael Shara in the 1970s, and the Killer Angels came out, of course. And it's not so much about the Killer Angels perpetuates a myth, but it perpetuates a focus, an undue focus. Remember, this book is about seven people, a spy, a British observer, four generals, and one one colonel. There are 118 general officers at Gettysburg, and they focus on four. There are more than 400 infantry regiments at Gettysburg, but the greatest focus of the book is on the main character, of course, Joshua Chamberlain in the 20th Maine. Never mind that Little Round Top was the least bloody engagement on the whole south end of the battlefield. Never mind the other 11 regiments fighting on Little Round Top. And this is the beginning of when the second day in the 20th Maine's fight became synonymous with each other, where the 20th Maine is the second day's fight. It's certainly that way in the Killer Angels. It's certainly that way in the Ken Burns series. Still the best Civil War documentary probably made that is ever going to cover the Civil War, but it's got its mistakes. And in Ken Burns, there's more on the 20th Main fight than on the whole rest of the first day and the remainder of the second day combined. And in Ken Burns, you even have something really disturbing where he gives a quote where he talks about uh, William C. Oates, again, middle initial C, you go for it, look it up if you don't know it, where he could have converted Little Round Top into a Gibraltar he could hold against 10 times the number of many had. Well, that's not what Oates said. He said round top. And in that context, round top doesn't mean little round top. It means big round top. And it changes the whole meaning. 
What disturbs me is, did Ken Burns not even know the difference? Has Little Round Top so obscured the larger hill that Big Round Top doesn't even matter anymore? I don't know if this was sloppy research or if it was intentional, but suddenly you have Little Round Top becoming so important. And by the way, I just want to say historically that there's a great newspaper account about a woman named Lily Neary who came out in early 1900s and said, everybody's wrong about this thing that Little Round Top is called Little Round Top because of its proximity to the larger hill, Big Round Top. She says, no, that's not right. Little Round Top is named after my ancestor, Peter Little, the man after whom the town nearby called Littlestown is named after. What we're still doing is scouring the records, of course, looking for the big family after whom Big Round Top is named. I, I wish you guys had a laugh track on this podcast so you could show how funny this was to everybody when they heard it. Now, that's other podcasts. Good. And, and, and we respect you for that. Now, after, you know, not too many people read The Killer Angels, although it won the Pulitzer Prize, not too many people read it until the movie came out. And then, of course, unfortunately, after Michael Shera's death, the movie came out and there's a whole separate thing about this, but the movie was just as focused as the book. And suddenly, Little Round Top has really exploded. It's the most important thing that ever happened. And Joshua Chamberlain is the commander of the Union armies. And, you know, but not everybody fell for this. Even after the movie, you have Harry Fonz, Tom Disjardin, Troy Harmon, Longacre, uh, Stephen Sears, others, you know, all being very measured in saying what they did. And, you know, Disjardin wrote a lot about Little Round Top. There's a guy, though, however, named Ken Discorfano, who has a book called They Saved the Union at Little Round Top. And even me, you know, myself, in my Little Round Top, a detailed tour guide, which came out in 2000, I said, I speculated that, and very possibly a nation was saved there. And I, I'm very embarrassed that I said that, because this is before I started thinking enough about this. So it's time to really examine this stuff. Gary, don't be embarrassed. I think the fact that you can admit that shows admirable personal growth on your part. So I think that I think that's quite admirable. Good, good. And let, let the record show that's the nicest thing that Jim Hessler has ever said about me. Well, it is the holiday season. That's right. Back to obviously bringing the Killer Angels in the movie into this. So would it be fair to say and summarize, again, I see this on social media a lot. We encounter it on the battlefield. People saying the book the movie created the myth of Little Round Top. No, they did not create the myth of Little Round Top. I think what you said is right. That myth already existed and it just kind of exploded after that. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, you can trace the growth of the myth. And it was long before the 1970s, long before the veterans were dead. That myth was already solidly in place. Nice. Of course, what the Ken Burns series and the book and the movie really did was really give it an even greater, more exalted place because there was no book that came before it that was seen so much as the Ken Burns series and the Gettysburg movie. And having said that, I'm a fan of the movie. I'm a fan of Ken Burns. And I strongly believe in the idea of popular history. I think it's easier for Jim, Eric, and I to undo the historical mess for the people that get interested because of those media. I'd rather have them get interested and come and then let's separate fact from fiction. So we've talked about what happened at Little Round Top. We've talked about the myth of Little Round Top and how that myth has sort of grown throughout the years. But let's look at this militarily. The whole idea that is if the Confederates captured this hill, this battle's going to be lost for the Union Army. This nation might be dissolved. Let's look at this from a numbers perspective. How realistic is it that the Confederates actually could have captured this hill? And not only that, what could they have done with it once they had it? I'm arguing here. Any responsible historian can't state with any degree of certainty that the Confederate capture of Little Round Top would have resulted in Union disaster, Union defeat, Union retreat, or Union loss of the Civil War. In fact, if you look at the, the actualities, I think quite the reverse is shown. Now, I want to stress that there were two points in the Battle of Little Round Top where the Confederates were most close to capturing it, and that is when the 4th Texas ascends the plateau just below the 44th New York Monument. That plateau, it's very well known to us. It was very close uh, to falling to the Confederates then, and of of course, when the 15th Alabama was bending back the line of the 20th Maine. So those are the two points I'm going to be talking about here. I'm not talking about what if Sickles would not have moved forward in the first place. I'm not talking about what if Longstreet's flank march would have been faster and they got there earlier. I'm not talking about what if Warren would not have been on Little Round Top and recognized the importance. I'm not talking about if Devil's Den would have fallen quicker. All of these deviate much farther from the actual event. Let's talk about Little Round Top at the places that people said it would have fallen and 
we can look about it. I'm talking about the success of the 4th Texas or the 15th Alabama. I'm not going to present a scenario for exactly what would have happened. Rather, I want to examine the military situation with you guys at what I've referred to in the book as the critical point. The critical point is not one regiment or another. It's that point at around 6 p.m. or so when Little Round Top might have fallen to the Confederates. So according to the writers you know, of, of some of the sources we mentioned, it would have resulted in Union disaster on the left and maybe more. Now, because I don't like what if history much for anyone who accuses me of what if history, of course, you all are at home and I can't necessarily hear from you, but I dispute this idea that this is what if at all. Rather, it is the hundreds of writers before me who have engaged in the what ifs and the filmmakers and the guides. They've engaged in the wholesale speculation, not me. I'm just trying to look at the military situation as we know it was. And I want to look at a series of factors, the very factors that would affect what the Confederates could or couldn't have done with the Hill in their possession. So for our listeners, Gary, what time are we talking about this moment? What do you think is the critical point on Little Round Top? Okay, so, you know, no standardized time, but we're generally talking about 6 p.m. And at that time, more chronologically speaking, the fight for Devil's Den is essentially over. The fight for the wheat field is raging at this point. The fight for the peach orchard might just starting to be heating up and 7,000 more Confederates are about to jump off in their attack. So we're talking about a time where there's a lot happening. I mean, and you can really only understand the fighting on the south end of the battlefield or any battlefield by looking at adjacent areas at the same time. These things did not happen in the vacuum. Of course, the fight for Little Round Top is connected to the Valley of Death and Devil's Den and the wheat field. Um, so we have to look at it this way. And the first thing you have to look at, the most important factor when veterans are fighting veterans, as they were in this case, is the crazy, overwhelming Union numerical superiority on July 2nd, 1863 on Little Round Top. So Again, equal numbers fought on Little Round Top, about 1,850 Confederates fighting about 1,850 Union soldiers. It's incredible that these two large armies would meet, and on the end of the line, they, they bring about a similar number. But all of a sudden, you know, the Union has General Weed coming up on the hill. Okay, he's fighting, and the Confederates have no fresh reinforcements at all, right? But they do have General Law and Benning, you know, and some of these other guys that have been fighting at Devil's Den, but they would have already suffered 30% casualties. So let's say they won at Devil's Den, and those 1,200 50 men could come and join the fight for Little Round Top, having suffered 30%. Okay. Now you've got other Union soldiers in the area. You've got Ayers Division. I mean, the area, it's about 4,000, but they're engaged. Let's not even talk about them. You've got Crawford's Division showing up, of course. And, you know, he's got a couple of brigades in there that are going to be involved. You know, some of them are engaged. So you're talking about 1,300 or so men under Fisher. So Fisher's Brigade might be available. And then you've got seven of the eight brigades of the Sixth Corps coming, another 9,300 soldiers. Now, let me stress that these orders for these soldiers soldiers to move there were already made before the fight for Little Round Top heated up. Okay, so it's not like Meade had to respond to this. He had already ordered all these troops over. And the Confederates have no reinforcements whatsoever. Seven of their nine divisions were already in attack. And the only two other Confederate divisions, Pickett's, wasn't on the scene yet. They're all the way out near Marsh Creek at 6 p.m. that day. And Heath is absolutely bloodied from the day before. They're out of sight and out of mind. So what you have here is 11,600 fresh Union reinforcements against 2,650 weary Confederate soldiers who had already fought either capturing Devil's Den or Little round top. Am I playing games with the numbers who included? No. No matter how you look at it, the Union had a ridiculous advantage of men. We're talking about 10 Union divisions fighting 10 Confederate brigades. 46,000 Union soldiers against less than 16,000 Confederate soldiers. That's why Longstreet called it the best three hours fighting ever done by any troops on any battlefield. Yeah, that was awesome. And I think that whole concept of the Confederates not having reinforcements always comes back to what we say. Lee is overextended. He doesn't have the ability really on either flank to put much depth into his attacks. And obviously it costs him on the Union left. So, yeah, that was great. And I think for the Confederates on July 2nd, it kind of comes down to what I call the three C's, coordination, communication, and command. They are lacking in all of those elements, especially on the southern end of the battlefield. It's difficult terrain anyway. I would urge anybody just walk through that area. Trying to get through it's challenging. Communicating through it is challenging. And by the way, Hood gets wounded very early into this action. So we've got new commanders and new roles. There's a lot working against the Confederates. And oh, by the way, it's a hot, humid day. And these guys have been marching as well. And we're certainly going to add, you know, that command C on there. And I have another C for you here. Condition. This is one of the hottest days of the summer. Both sides are hot, to be sure. Both sides have done their share of marching. But the Union troops who are reinforcing Little Round Top hadn't fought yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a massive difference. And the Union is on the home turf, which is always an advantage. And just real quick on the ammunition front, the Confederates 
Confederates reported that after the fight for Little Round Top that they were almost out of ammunition. The Union has fresh troops coming in with full cartridge boxes. The Confederates, where is their ammunition? I've seen one account, uh, and it's a weak one, of some Confederate ammunition train that was being pushed forward. But no Confederates that fought near Little Round Top were resupplied with ammunition until after dark. So this idea that the, somehow that the Confederates could really launch a fight is a little bit irresponsible. And then people start getting into artillery, because when you stand on Little Round Top, you know you could pummel Union into submission. So first of all, let's just say the Confederates can capture all six guns of Hazlitt's battery, even though they're spread out all over the hill, even though no one ever captured a battery intact at Gettysburg. It's almost like Hazlitt's guys aren't even interested in saving their guns. They'd be a lot easier to roll down the hill, by the way, than to get up there in the first place. So let's say they capture the guns and with the implements and with the ammo. Can six cannons really drive away just about the largest army in the world? And I think the key is to look at when the Union was firing from the north on July 3rd, 1863, when Benjamin Rittenhouse took over for Hazlitt, who was was killed on Little Round Top, he actually had trouble firing to the north. When Pickett's charge commenced and he was firing northwest, he could use four guns. And as Pickett started to move eastward, he could use two and then only one gun. Why is it that we think the Confederates can do what the Union couldn't? In one respect, I blame the park for this. Now, this is not me bashing the park, but I think when we look at the Gettysburg battlefield, we see cannons all over the place. What we don't see are caissons, we don't see limbers, and we also don't have horses out there. So we don't really think about the footprint that an artillery battery actually has to take up mm -hmm. on the field. So yeah. when we look at Little Round Top, when you have the cannons up there, yeah, it makes sense in your mind at a certain level. But when you think about everything else the artillery needs, it's just not feasible. Mm -hmm. Two of my favorite parts of your book were kind of that numbers analysis and what you just said about the artillery and their inability to fire north in any great numbers. I will tell you, I became a battlefield guide in 2003. Gary's book, The Myth of Little Round Top, which we're discussing tonight, was published in 2003. So fortunately, I didn't have to change my tour to accommodate Gary's book, which was awesome in of itself. But I think, in my mind, one of the biggest aha moments I had was when I read your book, you know, back in 2003 and said, wow, this guy's right. You couldn't turn multiple batteries to the north and dislodge the Union Army off Cemetery Ridge. So my question, Gary, as I was sitting here listening to you talk about that, did you kind of come up with this on your own? How did you sort of do all that? Did you go out there with measuring tape and kind of figure all this out? How did this all happen? No, I think that's a great point, and I didn't explain it well, so I appreciate the opportunity. I did what any historian is supposed to do, go back to the primary sources, and I read the post-battle official record of Benjamin Rittenhouse, who specifically talked about Little Round Top's thin apex. Again, there was no nice plaza up there. There was no path up at the top, and even when you go up today, you see it's a thin apex. You can look to the west, but try to get a group of 40 people looking north from Little Round Top at the same time. You really can't. So because it was a thin apex, the guns were necessarily side by side, and when you turn them to the right or to the left, they're going to be lined up one behind the other. That is, unless you can run the guns out further in order to do it. And they couldn't because the hill was too steep. The nature of the declivity, as I think they may have said, was made that impossible. So I don't see how the Confederates could have done it. And they would have been trying to drive away a Union army that was even further to the north than, the, say, the Union position on Cemetery Ridge. And I always make the point, too, if the Confederates get the guns, how are they going to fire them? I mean, when these artillerists bail, they get out of here. They're taking their stuff with them. Yep. They're taking their friction primers. They're taking their lanyards. They're taking all of this. You can have caissons up there and limbers up there, but if you don't have the ability to fire the cannon... In trying to make this a fair argument, what I set out to do was say, let's say the Confederates had every advantage, that, that all the Confederates who survived the fight for Little Round Top and for Devil's Den, if they all converged together on Little Round Top and captured all six guns and captured the implements and captured all the ammunition, what could they do with it? I don't want to have to fight with somebody about saying, oh, you're playing with numbers here, because I'm totally not. And to that end, let me mention that something else that the Confederates do have going for them, and it's about the only thing, is the position. If they capture the hill, I am not trying to say this is a good thing for the Union. One thing that the reason Hazlitt's battery was up there in the first place was because it was look good, showing a position of strength for the Union. Part of that had to do with Smith's battery atop Devil's Den too, showing with, with the booming cannons and the smoke rising up above these hills, making them look like volcanoes, like impregnable things. So that is the one thing the Confederates have going for them. But let me just say that this is a strong position, right? A lot of Confederates called it impregnable, but you know what? 
It's obviously not that strong. It almost fell twice with equal numbers. And let me say that the opposite side of Little Round Top, say the north and the east side where the Union presumably would have been counterattacking, it's a lot like the rest of it, except it's wooded. An enemy has the ability to get concealment and to attack without the worry of artillery from the north and the east side. So the position favors the Confederates, but not overwhelmingly, even if they captured it. We also have a good example of if the Confederates capture Little Round Top, what would happen? It's called Culp's Hill, July 3rd. It's going to be a counterattack. There's going to be an overwhelming force there. The Confederates are not going to be able to make any real gains from there. Well, and that's always been my take, too, on this Culp's Hill versus Little Round Top argument. While I agree with everything Gary is saying, I think you could make 99% of these same arguments for Culp's Hill, too. So should we talk about roads? Because I think you've hopefully convinced us fairly well that, look, they're going to have a lot of difficulty, A, holding the hill because of the numbers and the condition, and B, the issue with artillery and the inability to fire to the north. But the one thing I always hear with the Culp's Hill argument is, of course, the importance of the Baltimore Pike. And we're not diminishing the strategic value of the Baltimore Pike to the Union Army, but at Little Round Top, we have the Tawny Town Road, more or less running. I for, you'll tell me how many yards it is from Little Round Top to the uh, Tawny Town Road. But what do we think about the Confederates and their potential ability to capture that road? And frankly, should we even care? Now might be a good time to slow down the podcast playback as I, I predict I'm about to get worked up. So I think that there are two things that make us look into the roads. First of all, that the Confederates, people say with considerable certainty that the Confederates with Little Round Top in their position quite obviously control the Tawny Town Road and they have this ability to get into the Union trains. These this big trains, they can get into the Union rear. They're going to use the Tawny Town Road to do that, presumably. Now, remember, there are 10 roads leading into Gettysburg. The Confederates control eight of them on July 2nd, 1863 in the Tawny Town Road in the Baltimore Pike are the only ones left. The Baltimore Pike by far the more superior of the roads, Tawny Town being dirt, Baltimore Pike being crushed with limestone. But, you know, capturing a road and controlling it are two very different things. So let's look at it. Like Jim said, the Tawny Town Road is about 500 yards from the crest of Little Round Top at its closest point. So let's say the 2,650 Confederates who fought for Little Round Top and survived the fight for Devil's Den were all up there. It's going to take half of those Confederates just to reach in a regular line from Little Round Top to the Tawny Town Road to say nothing of controlling the Tawny Town Road. They need to maintain control over the point and they can't do so from afar because the woods are there. They can't just place guns and control the road because it's it's far too wooded at the time. There are supposedly these Union trains in the rear that the Confederates are going to disrupt. And here's my question. Where are these hordes of rebels coming from? The fact is there aren't any. The same Confederates who left Seminary or Warfields Ridge are the same ones who attack the Union left and supposedly succeed at Little Round Top. Then they're going to defend Little Round Top against no doubt coming Union attacks. They're going to man the artillery. They're going to capture the Tawny Town Road, roll up the Union flank, capture the Union supply train, and scare the Union army, the, again, just about the largest army in the world, into a costly retreat, defeating them along the way, and then win the Civil War. This is not fuzzy math. This is absolutely historically irresponsible to say anything. And here, right here in my book and on this podcast, I challenge anybody listening to find in the annals of military history an example where historians have placed so much faith into troops who failed to win as they put into the Confederates who never even took Little Round Top in the first place. Boy, I'm exhausted just listening to that. Look, I think what you're saying makes total sense. The idea that we've layered so many what ifs into this argument, and this is what I often do on my tours. If the Confederates could take the hill, if they could hold the hill, if they could use the artillery. Hell, I don't even bring the Tawny Town Road into the argument on the basic battlefield tour. There's just too many what ifs here. So I agree with you. I don't know, Eric, what are you thinking over there? Yeah, I think we can all agree as guides on a lot of our tours we do. People often want very simple answers to very complex questions and you look at little round top and you can kind of visualize it but when you really get into the nuts and bolts of it it's just not really feasible the numbers not. are not there you know there's any number of generals in history that have been attributed to saying god favors the larger battalions mm -hmm. The Union Army has larger battalions on July 2nd. Yeah, and again, and just with the theme of the episode, I'm going to agree with that. But again, what I'm also going to say is it's not so much, in my mind, the weakness of Little Round Top. It's, again, Lee, as I said before, Lee is overextended. The attack is overextended. So when Longstreet throws in that first round of brigades you know, from Hood's division, that's all he's got. There isn't going to be anybody else who's going to come. I think more than anything, that and a lack of coordination is ultimately going to be why the Confederates lose the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, the Union wins the Battle of Gettysburg, but I'm talking about why the Confederates lose. And again, nowhere is that more evident than at Little Round Top. 
And I couldn't agree with that more. In fact, you know, it's interesting. Battlefield guides, we really don't get to hear what each other says. I sometimes hear another guide's little round top talk, but, yeah. and once in a while, the high watermark. But I don't know what they're saying in the car from place to place. And this is fascinating to me because I couldn't agree more. On most tours that I give, I talk about that as being the story of Gettysburg. When the Confederates ascend East Cemetery Hill and capture nine cannons, and they're going to win the day, where are the Confederate reinforcements? There aren't any. And Hancock happens to be able to spare two brigades to send over. When the Confederates have some success at Devil's Den, where are their reinforcements? When they capture Lower Culp's Hill, they send three brigades of additional reinforcements, and then the Union responds with the five brigades that had left, plus four more just for fun. The interior lines and the larger army had an actual impact, and that's the story of Gettysburg. Where are the Confederate reinforcements? You know, and again, nowhere is that more evident than the most famous small unit action of the entire battle, the 20th Maine against the 15th Alabama. The 20th Maine is doing a great job, but it's not that the 15th Alabama gets reinforced by a second regiment and then a third regiment. It's the 15th Alabama having to reform and hit them again and again. And that is, you know, what you see all over this part of the field. I think something with a little round top, in many ways, I would argue its importance is that it draws Confederates away from areas where their weight could have mattered in Devil's Den and in the wheat field and moving up towards the peach orchard. That's where those numbers are needed. Not so much on Little Round Top. That's really interesting. And that's what I was about to bring up here is that I think you all know how the attack for Hood's division went. It was supposed to be Law and Robertson at front and Benning and Anderson behind them. The Georgia brigades were each supposed to support the front brigades. Of course, as I think you know, Law goes and splits up and you have Robertson splitting up. Benning gets confused and follows basically part of Law and Robertson to Devil's Den instead of Little Round Top. Imagine 1,300 more Confederates attacking Little Round Top. That's a pretty big what if, but that's how the orders were issued. And I want to get into one other thing because sometimes people can criticize and say, oh, well, the Confederates could capture a little round top, but there's not enough time for the Union to counterattack. And that is absolute BS. At the critical point, it's 6 p.m. There's still another hour and a half to sunset and another hour until actual darkness. This is summer. There's plenty of time. General Hood, remember, had less than two hours to attack and succeed with really tough ground and a one mile advance. The Union soldiers were all approaching this area long before dark. So there's plenty of time. And I want to segue right into basically the last two things, and that is command. The Confederate command, they've got some very capable officers, but as was already mentioned, Hood is down. You've also got six of 10 regimental commanders of these Confederate regiments who might have ended up ascending Little Round Top. They are already not in position. Two of the three brigade commanders aren't commanding the brigades they were two hours earlier. Like I said, Hood is down. Law takes over, but doesn't issue a single division level order until after the fighting's done. And you sort of have Benning taking over additional responsibilities. And there's Longstreet on the scene, but he He's over closer to the wheat field, arguably, and overseeing that. There's no Confederate division commander. Who's really going to oversee this? Maybe a Vander M. Law. That's a capable officer, but I'm not so sure. Now, I want to compare that to the Union. Lots of Union casualties, famous casualties, right? You've got Warren wounded. You've got, you know, Vincent and Hazlitt and Weed all killed or mortally wounded, but they're not the ones fighting the Confederates on Little Round Top in a counterattack. Only two command changes had occurred in any part of the Union Army in that sector, and that is among the eight brigades and the 33 regiments that Meade had already ordered to the Union left to protect it at all hazards. Sykes is there. Sedgwick is there. Hancock is there. Meade is there. It's really only Newton and Wheaton, Newton going over to the First Corps and Wheaton taking command of Newton's division, that really it would have affected this at all. So the Union command is intact. Their ammunition cartridge boxes are full. They have already made all these orders. So when you really look at the larger picture, both at Gettysburg and then later, the idea that the Confederates could have captured the Hill, one, done all these things they talked about, and then, of course, regroup between Meade and Washington and make me attack him. By no means is this any of this certain. It certainly weighs toward the other direction. So, okay, so we've done a lot of analysis here talking about how difficult it would have been for the Confederates to capitalize and use Little Round Top to advantage. That doesn't mean Little Round Top is not important. It just means the Confederates are going to have a lot of difficulty taking advantage of any gains that they potentially would have had. So, guys, if we kind of wrap up then the Little Round Top, the military value portion of this conversation... What then do we think is the value of Little Round Top? Because I don't know of any other Civil War battle where high ground on a flank would not be considered important. So what is the value? 
get ready to wrap your brain around this, but I have long said that Little Round Top is more important for the Union to retain than for the Confederates to capture. That's how I feel about it. It's not a good thing for the Union to lose, but I'm not sure if it is a deadly thing. I don't know if it would be deadly to the Union Army. Remember, these armies had fought each other for the better part of four years, and it's not like one ever completely destroyed the other one. Of course, that was General Lee's goal at every battle. He never succeeded at that, and I don't see how we can say that. Remember, the South almost captured Little Round Top twice Twice with equal numbers, why is it so hard to fathom a recapture by Union troops in greatly superior numbers who are fresh and with experienced commanders? So if Gettysburg is the largest battle, and perhaps according to some people, I don't say this, but at least a turning point of the Civil War, and the Civil War is by any account one of the most important events in our history, I think discussing the growths of these myths about the battle, critically examining the military situation, the time does credit to our nation and to some of the men who fought to make it what is. This is what we have to do as historians. Yeah, and I think for the men that are attacking the hill, for the men that are defending the hill, it matters. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're suffering casualties, it matters. And for me, when I often sort of sum up July 2nd for visitors on a tour, as I say, what we see is the Confederates almost capture Little Round Top. Mm -hmm. They almost capture Cemetery Ridge. They almost capture Cemetery Hill. And they almost capture Culp's Hill. The key word in all of that, almost. almost. They come very close. Yeah, you know, they're gaining yardage. I use, even use the analogy, if you're thinking of a football game, they go from one 20-yard line to the other 20-yard line. They've gained yardage, but they haven't scored any points. And eventually they hit Longstreet in the head with their helmet. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think it was some guys from Cleveland that did that the so, Longstreet. Right. Hey, the one thing, military value that I'm surprised did not come up that I'm going to throw out there. So when I take my tour groups up to Little Round Top, and what's one of the first things we often do? We say, what a view? Wow, what a view? Observation. Right. And I think what Governor Warren said, you know, when he went up there, I went by General Meade's direction to what is called Bald Top. And from that point, I could see the enemy's line of battle. So I think the observation value and the communication value with the signal station being up there, something we didn't talk about. And obviously, again, would have military significant value to the Army of the Potomac. And I think that's something that's really cool is that you can read a lot of the accounts from the signalmen that are on Little Round Top, what they're saying what they're saying, and what they're seeing. That's what's great about it. And I think the communication aspect of it and the observation aspect, I think that's a good point. And I'll really look forward to what some of the listeners have to say on the podcast Facebook page and and elsewhere to see what they have to say about all this. I love talking about this stuff, and I'd love to read what everybody has to say. This has been awesome. Great conversation on Little Round Top, but I really can't end it yet. Look, we're not engaging in what-if history. Gary and us and Gary's book, we've done some really reasoned analysis on all of the challenges the Confederates would have. But again, this often turns into a Little Round Top versus Culp's Hill argument. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to you guys. If we apply that same analysis to Culp's Hill, what do you guys think? Well, I'll say the myth of Little Round Top book, you know, took me a while to write. So uh, it would be hard for me to say, but taking those same factors, especially people say a lot of the same things about it. The Confederates were only 600 yards from the Baltimore Pike at their closest point near Culp's Hill. They could have unhinged the Union position on another hill, in this case, Cemetery Hill. They, I don't know if they make the artillery argument, but I think all those things, and, and of course, the idea of the roads and the Baltimore Pike there, and would the Union have had a retreat route? Would they have simply left or been forced to fight back on Culp's Hill? I would encourage somebody to do this study. Off the top of my head, we could apply this exact same method trace the growth of what people said about it from early to later, and then examine the military situation. This is what we're supposed to do as guides and historians. Yeah, and for me, you would have to look at when these events would be happening. It would almost have to be simultaneous. I think there has to be a breakthrough on Cemetery Ridge, a breakthrough on Cemetery Hill, and I think the Confederates would have to gain Lower Culp's Hill for this to really have an impact. And I think what we see is, once again, look at those final attacks on Cemetery Ridge. It's disorganized. It's worn out units. You basically get elements of two brigades on top of Cemetery Hill with Avery and Hayes. And really you're sending three brigades up Upper Culp's Hill. This is not overwhelming force to try to overrun these units. And I think you look at also, we're missing one brigade for the Confederates. We've got Stonewall Brigade east of town. We also have John Gordon's brigade that's kind of just there. They're not really being active on July 2nd. So some of these same issues we talk about with Little Round Top, I think they apply on that northern section of the Union line as well. Yeah, I agree. Unless Jackson was at Gettysburg. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a separate episode. My bad. Our most popular episode. Until this one drops, because this one was awesome. I bet this is going to possibly eclipse that.
I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, by the way, and I want to encourage you all to support Battlefield Preservation. I bet you a whole bunch of you do. Uh, go to battlefields.org to learn about what the American Battlefield Trust is doing at the time. And I promise you, if you go to our website, you will see some good ways to expand your dollar uh, that is going to be matched one to one, two to one, three to one, or even eight to one sometimes around the holidays. So I imagine a lot of you already use our content. Go to our YouTube channel, go to our Facebook page. Of course, after you listen to this podcast, go and see what the American Battlefield Trust has to offer. And I'll Thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation. Dare I say you're a super fan? Can we get that out of you on the broadcast? Am I a super fan? Absolutely not. I would be a super fan were I not friends with you guys, but you know, you don't want to pay too many compliments to your friends. Well, friends can be super fans too. Well, let me ask you guys, are you top fans of Gary Edelman's Civil War page on Facebook? Uh, I am a top fan of Ric Flair's Facebook page. Does that count? I comment sometimes on your page. That counts. Okay, what well, guys, I think you do a great job, and I love the podcast. We once again want to thank our friend and colleague, Gary Edelman, for joining us in the special holiday edition of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Before we put a holiday bow onto this episode, Jim, once again, tell us about our sponsor for this episode. Once again, the episode was brought to us by our friend Michael Hamula at RPM Search Group. Like Little Round Top, towers above the Union left flag. Mike Hamula and RPM Search Group towers above all other executive search firms in the industry. Take a look at their website, www.rpmsearchgroup.com, and see how they help companies in the United States and around the world for our global listeners identify, evaluate, and hire talent that will improve performance. Thanks again to Mike Homula at RPM Search Group for sponsoring this episode. So Eric, as we wrap up another episode, tell us once again, where can our listeners find us on social media? They can find us on Facebook at the Battle of Gettysburg Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Gettysburg Pod. And if you're on Instagram, you can find us at the Battle of Gettysburg Podcast. You can also reach us on email at gettysburgpodcast at gmail.com. Also, too, if you're a member of a Civil War roundtable or just any group that is looking for Civil War speakers and topics in general, Eric and I are both available to speak at Civil War roundtables really across the country and uh, all over the globe. So feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in scheduling either one of us to speak at your group. Or both of us. Or both. Hey, wouldn't that be awesome? Like a Jim and Eric show going on the road? How cool would that be? Hey, it can't just be the Tim and Gary show all the time. Woo! So as always, we want to thank you, the listeners, for joining us. This has been a really great year for the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. As we look back kind of now in the holiday season, we wouldn't be here without you. As I often say, without you guys, we would just be two guys talking about the Civil War in a bar. And nobody wants to hear that, right? That's stuffy. That's boring. Who would ever listen to that? That's not going to turn people on to history, man. But hey, in all seriousness, thank you for all the support you've shown us throughout the year and in upcoming seasons that are coming up. And I think I'll just close by saying, think of Dan Sickles this holiday season.